the sea sill. Now they want to turn it into some fancy place for hipsters who think a splash of misery is the same as authenticity. Me? I know better. As its janitor, I worked those halls thirty-some-odd years. Wiped up bloodstains junkies swore were just spilled wine. Mopped up vomit that'd turn your stomach green. Scrubbed away the Lord only knows what from those carpets. See, the Cecil ain't like other hotels. The Ritz, the Ambassador, those places got a shine you can fake. Not the Cecil. Its dirt is soaked into the bones like that stink of cigarettes no amount of bleach can take away. The sweet, rotting smell that clings to the drapes, no matter how many times you send them out. Every scuff on the walls tells a tale, if you know how to read them. Back then, nobody came to the Cecil looking for a vacation. They washed up because life had kicked them down, because they were hiding from something. The law, a bad deal, their own damn selves. Folks got names like Scarface and Bugsy, though their stories were more pathetic than glamorous. Hookers old enough to be your grandma and strung out kids that'd break your heart and steal your wallet while you were at it. And then there was the ones who didn't even seem to have names anymore, just eyes like dead fish staring out at nothing until, well, until they didn't. Me, I wasn't much different. Drifted west after the war, something broken inside me rattling with each passing mile. Found a rhythm to the Cecil, though. The endless scrubbing, the hushed echoes down those corridors when the sun went down, a kind of peace in the grime of it. Figured it was the closest I'd get. Should have paid more attention to the whispers. Not the crazy ones the drunks and addicts muttered, but the ones the building itself seemed to sigh. The way the shadows pooled a bit too thick in the corner by the fire escape. The cold draft that followed you even with the door shut tight. Wasn't a ghost in some white sheet. Nothing that obvious. The sea sill worked subtler, a nagging feeling, like a rotten tooth just starting to ache. Then 1985 rolled around, and the ache turned into a goddamn scream. Maybe it was always going to be that year. It was in the air, that sourness under the California sun, a darkness spreading like spilled oil. But the sea sill, it drank that darkness up, soaked it in. That's when things got real twisted. Room 14, 06. That's where it started, or where I noticed it anyways. The low hum, like angry flies against the window pane. Even when you swore it was empty. The smell, not the usual Cecil stink, but something sharper like an old animal burrow. You couldn't air it out, wash it out. Stuck to you, crawled inside your head. Then the stains. Not blood or nothing you could name, but dark and spreading like mold just under the wallpaper. Tried telling the manager, old Hank with his beer belly and eyes that never looked right at you. Got the usual shrug, the muttering about tweakers and how it had come out of my paycheck if I made a fuss. Police? Don't make me laugh. They turned up when there was a corpse to drag off. Didn't care about the rot while someone was still breathing. So it was just me and room 1406, the whispering, the stink, and that feeling like there were eyes on me, even with the door locked tight. Then he moved in. Wasn't much to him when you first looked. Weedy fellow, hair like it hadn't seen a comb since he was born, clothes that smelled like a weak old ashtray. The eyes, though, that's what stayed with you. Not so much the color, but the way they looked right through you. Like you weren't a person, but a bit of dust he couldn't be bothered to sweep up. Took up residence in 1406. The hum got louder. The smell clung to him like a shroud. He'd move through the halls, silent as a moth, those eyes flicking over everything. Made your skin prickle, like you were some bug waiting to be pinned down. Other guests complained. Whispers from behind cracked doors muffled footsteps at midnight. Each time I knocked on 1406, nothing but silence answered back, like the room itself was holding its breath. The stains got bolder, blooming up the walls. When I dared to take a damp cloth to them, they'd spread further, the edges darkening like bruises. And the shadows, they started behaving wrong. 
stretching out from his door, slithering under others, even when the light fell full on the floorboards, like the darkness itself was taking on a shape. Nights were the worst. The hum turned into a low throb, drumming in time with my heartbeat till I couldn't tell one from the other. I'd swear the walls around 1406 were bulging a bit, like something pushing against them from the inside. And sometimes, sometimes there'd be chanting, a low, guttural muttering, the words like nails scraping across my skull. No language I ever heard, not from any of the down and outers that passed through the lobby. Tried the Bible for a while. My ma raised me on it, figured it couldn't hurt. Just made me sleep fitful, the dreams turning wicked, all blood and twisted smiles. Besides, if God gave a damn about the sea sill, he had a twisted way of showing it. Found myself lingering outside that cursed door longer than I meant to. A morbid curiosity gnawing at me, mixing with the dread. There was a pull to it, can't explain it better than that. Like standing on the edge of a cliff, knowing one more step was a plummet, but being half sure you could sprout wings anyway. The smell got stronger the closer I got, rotting meat and old incense, enough to make a man gag. And that buzzing, right at the edge of hearing, making my teeth vibrate, took to carrying a little something extra in my cleaning cart. Brandy, the cheap kind that burned like hellfire but brought a blessed numbness after couple of swigs outside 1406 made the shadows less sharp, the chanting a bit more distant. Didn't stop what was happening in there, but it stopped me from feeling it quite so much. Started finding things. Little scraps of paper tucked into the bottom of trash cans, under the fire stairs. Doodles, I figured at first. All jagged lines and hooked shapes like a child trying to draw monsters but a child with a steady hand and a twisted mind. The longer I looked, the more they seemed to shift, to swirl right on the page, and that buzzing in my head would spike so hard I saw white. The whispers were getting clearer too, not from the other guests, dot, 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 F-R-O-M me. My own voice, murmuring his name in my sleep, Ramirez, spat it out like a curse when I woke, sweat-soaked and trembling found the name scrawled in my own hand on the back of my time card. Didn't even remember doing it. That's when I knew I was slipping away, piece by piece. First proper encounter happened on a Tuesday, around three in the morning. The night shift was always mine. Most drunks passed out by then, and the truly desperate didn't check in till dawn. Was pushing my cart down the 14th floor hall, that throbbing in my ears nearly drowning out the squeaking wheels when I saw him, just standing there outside his door, bathed in the sickly glow of that bare bulb they called lighting. He looked less like a man and more like a half-formed sketch, lank hair hanging past his shoulders, shadows making hollows of his face, and the eyes, bottomless pits reflecting the sickly yellow light. Lord knows how long he'd been watching me. Can I help you, sir? I asked, voice coming out rusty and too loud in the sudden silence. That buzzing cut off like someone flipped a switch. Didn't answer, just kept staring. A grin twitched at one corner of his mouth, not friendly, more like a dog baring its teeth. Then, just like that, he ducked back into 1406, the door slamming with an echo that made me jump. The stink was a living thing when he'd been close, clinging to my uniform. Made me scrub my skin raw in the showers, but it wouldn't leave. Went back to my little room behind the laundry, but couldn't find the bottle. Hands shaking too bad. Curled up on that stained cot and tried to pray. But all I saw were his eyes and those damned jagged drawings swirling in the dark. He started venturing out more after that. Not down to the lobby didn't seem to care much for people unless he was alone with them. He'd prowl the hallways, barefoot and silent, leaving those greasy smudges on the walls after. Sometimes I'd catch him by the rear exit, just staring down the alleyway with that hungry glint in his eyes. Like he was waiting for something, or someone. 
Once, found myself face to face with him in the elevator. Christ, that tiny space choked with the stench of him, sweat and old metal, and that wrong sweetness that turned my stomach. Tried to shrink into the corner, but those eyes locked onto mine. You see it, old man? He rasped, voice barely above a whisper. The elevator jolted, felt like the cables might snap. You see it, don't you? See what? I choked out, barely recognizing my own voice. The grin widened, too many teeth in that thin face. What's coming? Then the damn thing dinged, the doors creaked open, and he was gone. Stumbled out onto the lobby floor, legs like jelly, the back of my neck prickling where I knew he was watching me go. The dreams got worse. Not just nightmares, but like slipping into another skin. My hands doing things I didn't command. My eyes seeing through his eyes. Waking up gasping, tasting blood on my tongue. Each morning I'd look in the cracked mirror, half expecting it wouldn't be my own face staring back. Took to avoiding the fourteenth floor as best I could. Lie to Hank, say there were burst pipes, busted toilets, anything to stay away from that humming, throbbing room. Couldn't do it forever, of course. He was drawing me back. There was a plan, see. Something big and terrible, and I was a part of it, whether I wanted to be or not. Just had to wait till he was ready. It started with the impossible figure. Just a shadow at first, but not the kind any light source could cast. Tall and hunched, gliding down the hallway towards 1406. The flickering bulb above flickered out just as it passed, plunging the corridor into a darkness that throbbed. I fumbled for my flashlight, the beam cutting into the gloom, but it was gone. Just the lingering chill and the echoing silence. Told myself it was a trick of the eye, too much brandy and too little sleep. Yet, the next night, it happened again, and again. Each time a bit bolder, the darkness seeping from the figure to stain the air. Then came the whispering. Eddie, it hissed, a breath of rotten wind against my ear. I spun around, flashlight slashing through the empty hallway. Nothing there. Yet, my name lingered, whispered again from another direction, another, till it filled the entire space, bouncing off the walls, the floor, the very ceiling. Eddie, Eddie, Eddie. A chorus of mocking voices, not my own, yet somehow coming from inside me. The stain was my breaking point. I spent a whole damn day scrubbing at it, bleach eating holes in my coveralls, fumes burning my eyes and lungs. When I finally gave up, it was wider, darker, almost pulsating. And in the center, a shape took form, a horned face, a twisted leer, not carved, not painted, but as if the evil in that room had soaked through the layers of cheap wallpaper and bloomed onto the surface. Kept telling myself it wasn't real. Delirium, the drink doing its work, something rotting away inside my mind. But the longer I stared at that horned face, the more certain I became it was staring right back. The whispers got names then, not just mine. Names I saw scrawled in the news down at the corner store, faces on flyers taped to telephone poles. Victims. Tried the church then. Figured if any place had a chance against the Cecil's particular brand of darkness, it'd be holy ground. Old Father Martinez took one look at my wild eyes, listened to my ramblings about whispers and bloodstains, then gently suggested a long stay at the county hospital. Maybe he saw the truth, maybe just another crazy ranting about devils. Either way, didn't have any holy water or exorcisms to offer. Desperation's a funny thing. Makes you crawl where you once stood tall. Back I went to the sea sill, to that 14th floor. Stood outside room 1406, the whispering buzzing through my head, hand trembling on the doorknob. Help me, I whispered to the peeling paint and that damned monstrous stain. Please, what do you want? The answering silence was the worst of it. That's when I knew there was no help just me and the darkness twisting and turning in that room. It wanted witnesses, wanted to infect, and I couldn't let it. 
found the emergency axe behind the fire extinguisher. Wasn't much of a plan, just a scream bottled up for too long finally breaking free. Took a swing, then another, wood splintering with each strike. The damn door didn't budge, but the buzzing within got louder, a thrumming counterpoint to my ragged breaths. I hacked away with the axe, desperation fueling my swings. It might not have been much, looked more like a madman's attack than anything, but at least I was fighting back. The stench coming from the splintered wood was enough to make your eyes water, a sickly sweet miasma that clawed at your throat. Finally, with one last desperate heave, the lock gave way. The door swung inward with a scream of rusted hinges, revealing a darkness so thick it seemed to have weight. The buzzing escalated, a high-pitched whine that made my teeth vibrate. I stumbled back, the axe clattering to the floorboards. In that moment, a flicker of my old life flickered through the haze of terror. This wasn't a hotel room anymore. It was the maw of some monstrous beast waiting to swallow me whole. Then came the chanting. Not the low, guttural muttering I'd grown accustomed to, but a full-blown chorus. Words in a language I didn't understand, but their intent was clear. A beckoning, a welcoming to some ungodly ceremony. Panic, cold and primal, flooded my veins. I turned to flee, but the hallway outside was gone. Walls pulsated with that same inky darkness, the floorboards melting away beneath my feet. Everywhere I looked, the chanting voices echoed, the horned face from the stain leering at me from every direction. Suddenly, a blinding light. It forced a scream from my throat, a raw, animal sound. When I could finally open my eyes, the darkness was gone. The hallway was bathed in the harsh white glow of the overhead fluorescent lights. But something was off. Too quiet. No buzz. No whispers. Not even the familiar groan of the aging pipes. Just me, standing in the middle of the pristine hallway, the axe lying innocently at my feet. Room 14. O six 6 stood there too, the door closed, not a scratch on it. Had I imagined it all? Was the Colt 45 beer finally turning my mind? But a quick glance at my hands told a different story. They were raw, bloody even, from the splintering wood. No hallucination could explain that. Heaving myself onto the floor, I fought back the rising tide of nausea. This wasn't over, not by a long shot. I knew then, with a sickening certainty, that what lurked in 1406 wasn't a petty demon to be banished with a prayer and a holy cross. This was something bigger, older, something that clung to the very fabric of the sea sill itself. Desperate for help, I stumbled down to the police station, clutching the axe handle like a talisman, told them everything, the chanting, the darkness, the face in the stain. They took one look at me, the wildness in my eyes, the blood-stained hands, and saw another drunk muttering conspiracy theories. Skid Row's a rough place, buddy, a young officer said, a smirk playing on his lips. Maybe you should consider another neighborhood. They didn't take my statement, didn't even look at the axe, just shooed me out like a bothersome fly. On the street, the world seemed impossibly bright, clean even, but the taste of fear and helplessness lingered on my tongue, a coppery tang that wouldn't wash away. Back at the sea sill, the manager, Hank, greeted me with a sneer. Lost your cleaning supplies again, Eddie. Next time, try not to take them to the bar with you, all right? Denials died in my throat, useless against his dismissive attitude. The Cecil, it seemed, protected its secrets fiercely, even if it meant feeding them more victims. Alone in my cramped room, the whispering started again, not from the hallway this time, but from within. It slithered through my head, a snake coiling around my sanity. Help me. It rasped, mimicking my own voice. No, I croaked, voice hoarse from the day's ordeal. Get out. Join us. It countered, the voice growing stronger, more seductive. Together we will be free. 
The axe lay on the floor, a silent temptation. Maybe, in that moment of complete despair, the whisper almost had me convinced. Almost. But a flicker of my old defiance sparked back to life. This wasn't over. I wouldn't let it win. Days blurred into nights. The whispers were constant companions now, needling into my brain. Sleep offered no respite, just vivid nightmares fueled by the evil emanating from 1406. The smell of rot and incense permeated my clothes, my skin. It clung to everything, making me an outcast even among the outcasts. I started to recognize a pattern. Each day, sometime around midday, the chanting would fade, the buzzing lessening to a throb I could almost endure. The occupants of 1406 were out, feeding their darkness on the bustling streets of L.A. That's when I had to act. My hands trembled as I fished the master key from my cart. It felt cold and heavy in my grasp, a weapon against the unspeakable. My heart pounded in my chest like a trapped bird as I slid the key into the lock of 1406. The tumblers clicked with a finality that made the hairs on my neck stand on end. With a sickening lurch, the door swung inward. The smell that hit me was so overpowering it felt like a physical blow. I gagged, fighting to keep my meager breakfast down. The room looked normal, almost mundane. A dingy bed, an overflowing ashtray, clothes scattered on the floor. Yet, the air crackled with a malevolent energy that made my flesh crawl. The chaos was only skin deep. It took a moment for my eyes to adjust, to see past the squalor and into the meticulously ordered darkness beneath. The sketches, once scattered haphazardly, were now arranged on the wall. They formed a grotesque tapestry, flayed bodies, contorted faces, symbols that throbbed even on the bare paper. In the center, more fully formed than its brethren, was the horned visage from the stain. No artistic flourish there, just a stark portrait of pure evil. Below the sketches, an open suitcase rested on the unmade bed. It was filled with... Trophies was the only word for it. A lock of tangled hair, a faded photograph with the victim's eyes scratched out, a silver pendant tarnished black. Objects that carried the weight of suffering, tiny talismans of pain. Each one sent a jolt of terror through me. I recognized those faces from newspapers, from missing person posters, his victims. On the nightstand, a leather-bound journal lay open, filled with a script I didn't recognize but seemed to pulse with its own dark energy. He didn't just stalk his prey, he studied them, planned their demise in horrific detail. The meticulousness of it, the chilling premeditation, was almost worse than the acts themselves. Then, a noise that made my blood freeze. Footsteps in the hallway, approaching 14 Oh, 06. Panic flooded me, a cold wave crashing over my fear-addled mind. I had to get out, escape while I could, but a morbid fascination rooted me to the spot. I just needed to see his face again, to confirm that what lurked within him was truly inhuman. I dove under the bed, the rotting mattress pressing against my back. My lungs burned as I fought to still my ragged breathing. Through the gap between the bedspread and the floor, I could see the door. Boots appeared in the frame, those familiar stained jeans. My heart hammered so loudly against my ribs I feared he'd hear it. Eddie? The whisper, barely louder than a breath, carried through the room. He knew. The door opened wider. Shadows stretched and twisted, but his form stayed obscured. Perhaps some twisted mercy of the room, shielding me from the sight of his true self. The chanting started, a soft yet menacing chorus from the walls themselves. The buzzing spiked, a swarm of angry wasps lodged in my skull. It was too much, too loud, too real. With a wordless scream, I burst from under the bed, a pathetic human weapon against an ageless evil. The room seemed to warp as I charged the shadows lurching, hands clawing at me. 
All I saw was the open door, freedom a few desperate strides away. He moved faster than I thought possible. One moment a shadowy outline, the next he was right there, pinning me to the floor. His touch burned, a searing pain on my arm. I thrashed, animal fear overtaking me. He reeked of death and desperation. You will join us, he hissed, his eyes black pools sucking in the light. His fingers dug into my flesh, seeking purchase. I kicked out wildly, a desperate flailing. My heel caught his shin. He snarled, the grip loosening just enough. I scrambled free, stumbling into the doorway. The hallway was swirling, walls melting into each other. The buzzing reached a crescendo, a physical force pressing against my eardrums. A scream tore from my throat. The chanting voices boomed louder, echoing, mocking. I ran, blindly, driven by pure terror. Each gasp of air seared my lungs. The floor tilted and shifted beneath my feet. The horned visage seemed to leer at me from every corner, a monstrous reminder of my failure. Behind me, his footsteps pounded in relentless pursuit. The chanting morphed into a single word, over and over. Join. The fire escape, a beacon in the churning madness. I lurched towards it, fumbling with the rusted latch. It swung open with a shriek, the cool night air a shock to my burning skin. Didn't look back. I clambered onto the metal steps, the buzzing fading slightly with each rung. He was below, a silhouette against the harsh glow of the city lights. Staring up at me, that hunter's grin twisting his face. He raised a hand, not as a threat, but as if beckoning. My escape wasn't an escape at all. He knew I'd run. He wanted me to. His prey, marked and fleeing into the shadows of the city. I kept climbing. Each metal groan echoed my ragged breaths, mirrored the frantic pounding in my chest. The darkness closed in, not comforting, but laced with the same evil I'd just escaped. The city lights below, once symbols of life, now bled together into a kaleidoscope of twisted beauty that reflected the monster blooming within me. Something had changed. Ramirez wasn't just hunting others anymore. He was hunting me, had made me a part of his horrific game. I reached the rooftop, the cool breeze whipping at my soaked clothes. The buzzing was faint now, replaced by the relentless thudding of my own heart. My sanctuary was an island in a swirling ocean of darkness. Ahead lay a maze of rusted pipes, shadowy alcoves, and nowhere to run. I don't remember the trek down the emergency ladder nor back to the police station. Just flashes of it, falling down the second floor ladder, adrenaline pushing me through alleys, eyes darting at every shadow, the faint whispers echoing in my wake. My body moved on autopilot, driven by the desperate hope that somehow, this time, they would listen. I burst through the doors, a whirlwind of terror. The desk officer, a bored-looking woman with chipped nail polish, barely glanced up from her magazine. Can I help you? The words poured out of me in a torrent. Room 14. 06. The rituals, the trophies, the horned face. My voice rose higher with each accusation, cracking with the strain. I ripped open my shirt, showing the angry red mark where he'd grabbed me, the undeniable proof. She sighed, tossed the magazine aside. Sir, I'm going to need you to calm down. You're disturbing the other. That's when it happened. The TV bolted to the wall, blared an emergency news bulletin. I froze the words tumbling from the newscaster's mouth like a death sentence. Series of brutal murders plaguing Los Angeles. The suspect, identified as Richard Ramirez, also known as the Night Stalker, is still at large. His face flashed onto the screen, those dead eyes, the jagged grin. It couldn't be a coincidence. He was out there, killing, right now. And I knew where he began. It's him, I shouted, pointing frantically at the screen. He's in the sea sill. That's where he plans it, where it all starts. The bored officer rose then, 
her gaze filled with suspicion. Next to her, two more cops appeared, burly men with nightsticks and hard eyes. Listen, buddy. One of them snarled. We've had enough of your crazy stories. You're coming with us. No pleas, no explanations. They saw me for what I was, a dirty old man, reeking of liquor and desperation. Just another Skid Row casualty spouting nonsense about monsters and devil worshippers. They shoved me into the back of a police car, the siren blaring as they sped off. Not away from danger, but right into its heart. The news report on the radio was a relentless drone. More victims, more gruesome details. The city gripped in a vice of fear. The station was a burst of chaos, phones ringing, officers barking orders. It was all background noise to the crushing realization that I was utterly alone. Ramirez, the Night Stalker, was free. His evil wasn't just contained within 1406. It was spilling out into the world, poisoning everything. And I'd led them right to him. They left me in a cramped room, the smell of stale coffee and old sweat clinging to the air. I tried to explain again, pacing in a tight circle. But they just muttered about drunks and addicts. Nobody came. Nobody listened. Each tick of the clock felt like a hammer blow. Out there, he was free to stalk, to kill. And they wouldn't even look in the right place. The sea sill, pulsating with its ancient evil, would protect its monster. Despair, thick and suffocating, settled over me like a shroud. I slumped against the grimy wall, the echo of my frantic pleas bouncing back in my head, hollow and unanswered. The harsh fluorescent lights overhead buzzed with an irritating monotony, a mockery of the storm raging in my mind. Just another drunk ranting about shadows. That's how they saw me. Maybe they were right. Maybe the terror, the whispers, the horned face. It was all a product of a mind pickled in cheap booze and despair. A desperate attempt to find meaning in the chaotic mess that was my life. But then... A flicker on the TV mounted in the corner of the room cut through the suffocating silence. The image resolved into a newscaster, face grim, voice urgent. A stark headline splashed across the screen. Serial killer on the loose, police hunt night stalker. My heart lurched, a hummingbird trapped in my chest. My mumbled pleas rose to a shout. There, see, that's him, Richard Ramirez, he's the one. I scrambled to my feet, the image of his gaunt face filling the screen, those bottomless pits for eyes staring back at me. Silence. The two officers who had shoved me in this room just moments ago didn't even look up from their paperwork. One of them, a burly man with a perpetually chewed-on cigar jutting from his lips, let out a derisive snort. Here we go again, he muttered, not bothering to glance at me. Another Skid Row prophet with a story to tell. Exasperation, laced with a sliver of hope, clawed its way up my throat. He's real. He's staying at the sea sill. Room 14, 06. That's where it all starts. I pointed at the screen, the image of Ramirez burning into my memory. The other officer, a young woman with a bored expression, finally lifted her head. Look, buddy, she said her voice flat. We appreciate your concern, but we have procedures and random accusations from... She trailed off, her gaze sweeping over me with undisguised distaste. People like you aren't exactly top of our priority list. They were right, of course. I was a nobody, a washed-up janitor with a penchant for cheap liquor and wild stories. But Ramirez... Ramirez was a monster, a predator stalking the streets, leaving a trail of death in his wake. Suddenly, the gravity of my situation slammed into me. My frantic warning about Room 1406 might have just sealed Ramirez's escape. By leading them to the sea sill, I'd inadvertently pointed them towards a dead end. The very hotel that harbored his evil would also shield him, its labyrinthine corridors and transient residents providing the perfect camouflage. Panic clawed at my throat. 
I had to get out of this room, back to the Cecil, warn someone, anyone. Maybe Hank, the manager, wouldn't dismiss me so easily. Maybe if I could just get close enough to 1406. The thought was cut short by the clanging of the cell door. Two new officers, younger and less jaded than the first two, stood at the threshold. Their expressions, however, were no more encouraging. You're ready, right? One of them asked, his voice clipped. Yeah, I croaked, hope flickering momentarily. Listen, about Ramirez. Let's take a ride, he interrupted, gesturing towards the door. Disappointment washed over me. Not the police station, not yet. Where were they taking me? They led me past a maze of cubicles and barking orders down a sterile hallway and finally to a stark white room with a single steel table bolted to the floor. A man in a crisp suit sat behind it, a bored expression on his face. He looked me up and down, a predator sizing up its prey. So, he said, his voice smooth like polished marble. You claim to know something about the Night Stalker? I launched into my story, recounting everything. The chanting, the smell, the horned face on the wall, the meticulous sketches, the trophies, everything I'd witnessed in room 14, 06. The man listened impassively, tapping a pen against the table with a steady rhythm that grated on my nerves. Interesting he finally said, a hint of something akin to curiosity flickering in his eyes. And you have proof of any of this? Proof? What proof did I have? My word against the twisted reality of Room 1406? The evidence I saw could be dismissed as the ramblings of a delusional drunk. There. There were things, I stammered, a knot forming in my throat. Things? The detective raised a skeptical eyebrow. Trophies? Sketches? We would have found something like that during a routine search, wouldn't we? He had me there. It all vanished so quickly. The sketches dissolved. The smell faded. The chanting silenced. Only I remained, smelling of sweat and desperation, my sanity hanging by a thread. It was there. I swear. I pounded a fist on the table the echoes startling in the sterile room. Things no normal person could imagine. But the room, it cleans itself up, hides the worst of it. He's connected to the sea sill, to its darkness. The detective leaned back, a flicker of amusement in his eyes. The hotel cleans itself up? Right, or maybe it's the cleaning staff. Ever consider that? Heat flushed through me, embarrassment mixed with rage. Of course, they just thought I was sloppy, covering my own ineptitude with a fantastical tale, trying to deflect blame onto something supernatural to save my skin. You don't get it. He's not some petty thief. My voice cracked on the last word. I couldn't go on. Explaining it made me sound even crazier. We sat in silence for a stifling eternity. The ticking of the clock felt like mocking laughter. Finally, the detective sighed. Look, we'll check out your hotel. Humor you, okay? Just keep your head down and try not to cause trouble. It was meant as a dismissal, but a spark of mad hope flared within me. They were going to see. They would finally see. An hour later, I sat handcuffed in the back of a police cruiser. We didn't head towards the sea sill, but back to the station. Amid the chaos of the news report, my claim had been dismissed as the ravings of a drunk. The hunt for the Night Stalker consumed them. One old janitor with a wild tail wasn't worth their time. As the car pulled back into the station, my struggle faded. My story was now just another dead end, another wasted lead. Ramirez remained free, his darkness spreading unchecked. Maybe the man in the suit had been right. It was the liquor, the years of witnessing too much, that had warped my mind. The thought was somehow more terrifying than any horned visage. Later, locked back in that same cell, I tried to pray. But the words wouldn't come. Just the name whispered over and over in my head. Ramirez, 
Ramirez, Ramirez. It was like his whispers had become my own. I stared at the damp concrete walls, seeing his face in the peeling paint, his eyes in the cracks. Had I always been this mad? Was the evil not just in room 1406, but festering inside me all along? The sea sill didn't attract the darkness I did. It saw something in me, a brokenness to twist and exploit. As sanity slipped away, a chilling clarity descended. It didn't matter whether I was crazy or not. The horror was real. The city was awash in blood, a grim testament to the evil I had failed to stop. Ramirez, the Night Stalker, was out there, free to hunt, to kill. And that's when I started to laugh. It began as a choked sob, then erupted into a guttural, maddened cackle that bounced off the cold walls. They'd locked me up, labeled me the lunatic, when the true monster roamed free. The irony was so monstrous, so absurd, it was all I could do. Years. That's how long it took for the maddening laughter to fade. The sterile walls of the institution became my world. White coats, muffled whispers, the dull routine became the rhythm of my existence. They called it treatment, but it was imprisonment, a way to lock away those who didn't fit, couldn't function in their tidy world. My ramblings about Ramirez and the Cecil tapered into a background drone that they tuned out, like the buzzing of fluorescent lights. They charted my decline in neat clinical terms, paranoia, auditory hallucinations, schizoaffective disorder, labels that meant nothing, explained nothing about the darkness I had witnessed. Sometimes, in the quiet of a sleepless night, I'd think of Hank and the Cecil. Wonder if it still stood, a blight against the indifferent California sky. Did it still hum, throb, whisper? Did some new tenant, another desperate soul like me, stumble upon room 1406 and feel the evil stir? There were days when the whispers returned, not the guttural chanting of before, but my own voice twisted and warped. It would taunt me, remind me of my failure. You let him out, Eddie. You set him free. I'd argue at first, fight against the insidious words, but doubt gnawed at me. Was I a victim or an accomplice? My frantic warnings had pushed the cops towards the sea sill, leading them away from the true horror that was unfolding all across the city. They medicated me, of course. Pills that dulled the voices, blunted the memories into a hazy blur. It was a sort of mercy, a surrender to the inevitable. They wanted to erase the past, to mold me into a docile patient, just another hollow shell shuffling through the corridors. But some nights, when the moon hung full and the shadows danced on the asylum walls, I'd see it again, the horned face, those hungry eyes. And I knew a truth the doctors never could. The evil hadn't begun with Ramirez. The seed had always been there, a darkness clinging to the world itself. The sea sill, maybe me, we were just its conduits, vessels for something older and far more terrible. Ramirez. They caught him eventually. His face was plastered across newspapers and TV screens, a boogeyman brought to heel. Yet, my nightmares never faded. He would melt into the shadows, only to re-emerge as someone else, a stranger on the street, a new orderly with dead eyes. Was it madness or a terrible gift of sight? I don't know anymore. They pat my shoulder, tell me I'm getting better, progressing. Soon, they say, I might even be eligible for limited release, a supervised group home where I can stare out the window and mumble my secrets to no one in particular. But I know release is an illusion. I'm trapped, just in a different sort of room. The sea sill echoes in my mind, and the whispers of true madness dance in my ears. Some nights, if I listen closely, I think I hear Ramirez laughing too. They say time heals all wounds. A lie. Some wounds fester, the scars a constant reminder of the infection beneath. In the quiet, when the pills wear off and sleep is a distant dream, I think about evil. 
Did it begin with Ramirez, a twisted seed that blossomed in the fertile ground of the sea sill, feeding on its decay in the endless parade of broken souls who pass through? Or was it the other way around? Was the hotel itself the malignancy, the room just a pustule on its ancient, rotten flesh? Ramirez was a symptom, a monstrous manifestation of an evil that lingered in the cracked plaster and the blood-stained carpets. Sometimes I imagine the sea sill without him. Would it have remained a place of quiet misery, a graveyard for the dreams of lost souls? Or would some other darkness have bloomed in its place? Was I fated to be its witness, its prophet forever ignored and eternally doomed? They call me delusional. Perhaps they're right. Maybe madness is the only true response to a world where such things exist. But even in my fractured state, a chilling question lingers, like the fading smell of incense and old blood. The sea sill was not born evil, just as men aren't born monsters. It became. But when did the change occur? When did the first shadow become something more? Was there a single act, a pivotal moment of cruelty or despair that tipped the scales? Or was it a slow, relentless darkening, like rot seeping through ancient wood? My hands tremble as I scrawl these words. Soon a nurse will bustle in, chipper and oblivious to the abyss. I'll hide this scrap of paper, another mad confession to add to my file. They'll never understand. But perhaps you, reader, whoever you are, will feel a prickle of unease, a shiver down your spine. For the sea sill could be anywhere. It might be the run-down apartment complex on the edge of your town, the house with the perpetually drawn curtains, or even the neglected corners of your own soul. Evil, I fear, doesn't need an invitation. It lingers, waits, and watches for the moment the light begins to fade. And who knows what monstrous forms it might take when the shadows finally lengthen. We hope you have enjoyed this episode of Quantum Dispatches and stay tuned next week for another thrilling adventure. Thank you for listening.